The Last Supper says, uh, Jesus says to all of his disciples, that all of them are about to fall away. And Peter says, I will never fall away, even if I have to sacrifice my own life, I will not fall away from you. And Jesus looks right at Peter and he says, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Uh, in plain language, Jesus says, before morning, you will have disowned me. You will have claimed that you do not know me three times. So looking at that passage, if you're taking notes, Matty, Luke, chapter 22, verses 54 to 62, says this, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him, to, uh, took him to the house of the high priest, him being Jesus. Peter followed at a distance. Uh, when some there had, had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him, uh, saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I do not know him, he said. A little later, someone else uh, saw him and said, You are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, uh, about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was, uh, was with him, for he is a Galilean. They recognized his hick accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, okay, I, I, I spent most of my adolescence in Harrowsmith, mm -hmm. so I know what a hick accent sounds like. Uh, I grew up in Amherstview, so I did not have one. Um... <laughs> No. What street? What street? Loyalist. Sure. For us. Yeah. Yes. Familiar with it? Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> in particular parts of this country, there are very noticeable nuances in the English accent. Some are more obvious than others. Newfoundland, for example, it's, it's almost an entire language on its own. <laughs> Peter is essentially from Galilee, which is essentially the Newfoundland of the promised land in this, in this time. They have a very noticeable accent. They do not speak like the uh, people in Jerusalem. And this woman identifies that Peter is not from, from from where they are. He's an outsider. He is from where Jesus is from. They must know each other. When I was in England ten years ago, yeah, ten years ago, twelve years ago, something like that. Back when you were forty. What's that? What? <laughs> Back when I was forty? Wow. <laughs> James said that. I was in my twenties then. You were eighteen. You were eighteen. Then. What's that? Eighteen? Yeah, I'm eighteen again. <laughs> no, you worried. <laughs> uh, when I was in England, <laughs> when I was in England, people could look at me and, and 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 they would say, "Okay, they can't tell if you're not from there." The moment you open your mouth, uh, they know you're not from there. There is no such thing as an English accent. There's about 500 different English accents. We're only really familiar with the ones that we hear on TV, which usually comes from London, the proper BBC accent. But when you speak there, they just look at you, but you're not from here. Where are you from? You've, you've, you've broken our language. It's, it, it, this is what's going on here. They recognize where Peter is from, based on what he says and how he says it. Continuing on with the story. Um, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Just as he was, just as he was speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and, and, uh, and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. Uh, the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. He will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. 
The crucifixion happens. Jesus dies. Uh, they put him in a tomb. They seal it tight. And we pick up the story Easter Sunday. When the Sabbath was over, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary mother, of Jane, Mary mother of James, and, and Salome brought some spices so that they might go and go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early the next day, uh, very early the next, uh, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, "Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb?" But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. They entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The angel goes out of his way to make sure that Peter hears that Jesus has risen. Very important. We continue the story in John chapter 21. And afterward, Jesus again appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two other, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early the next morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the, on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, loved said, said to Peter, It is Jesus. Sorry, it is the Lord. Soon, as, soon as, Simon, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat. They were a little more sane. Peter decided to swim to shore. The disciples stayed nice and dry. Uh, the disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they, were, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw, they, saw fire burning, uh, they saw fire of burning coals, there were fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have, you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was, it was full of large fish, 153. Somebody counted them. But even with so many, the net was, uh, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask, ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, uh, took the bread, and gave it to them, and, and did the same with the fish. This was, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death with which Peter would glorify the Lord. Then he said to him, follow me. 
Peter turned to him, and Peter turned to him and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. Um, Peter denies Jesus three times. The angel on the resurrection morning makes a point to say, make sure that Peter hears that I have risen. And then we have this story where Jesus comes and seeks out Peter. And he restores him. You know, he asks him first, Peter, do you do you love me? And we miss this in the Greek, and we miss this in the English. Greek has four words for love, three are used in this passage. Peter, do you love me? And Peter, Peter responds, Yes. You know that I like you. And Jesus again asks him, Peter, do you love me? And again, Peter says, yes, you know that I like you. And a third time, Jesus asks him the question, this time he uses Peter's word, Peter, are you sure that you like me? Peter's a little upset at this point. Jesus keeps drawing, he keeps pounding the point home. Follow me, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs. In this moment, Jesus is restoring Peter back to where he was. He's restoring him back to a place. I identify with this guy so much. But what are we going to do with all of this? One, when it comes to being a disciple, none of the twelve lived up to the ideal. We talked about the ideal earlier. Obedient, surrendered, a student, a follower. Hi. What was yours, Caleb? Uh, worshiper. Worshiper? Sure. That was good. Committed follower. Oh, I said obedient already, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, all those things are the idea, right? If anyone is to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Daily die to yourself and follow after me. Stop living for yourself and start living for me. None of these disciples got it. They all fell away. They were not the ideal. None of them lived up to it. Yet Jesus still showed, uh, Jesus still chose them. Jesus still pursues them after he rises from the dead. I'd be a little ticked off if I were Jesus. You follow me around for three and a half years and you, you, you can't follow me to the cross. Really? I'd be a little upset. That's just me. I'd be hurt. I'd take it personally. I'm glad he didn't. He would. Uh, I would. Number two. Stumbling and falling is an unfortunate natural part of growth. It's how we respond to our own failure when we fall. It's how we respond that's, that's important. Falling is inevitable. At some point, you're going to disappoint everybody, even me. It's going to happen. You're going to fall, you're going to fail at some point. Somebody's going to catch you in that moment of failure. And you're going to hurt. That's how we respond to that failure. That matters. I have a friend in BC. He belongs to a Chinese church that I, I spoke at their youth camp a number of years back. Uh, he's in college. He's in university now, and he's going through a he's going through a bit of a journey. Going through a bit of a journey, uh, and through 
some of life's circumstances that got thrown at him in the last number of weeks and months. Uh, he's done a lot of soul searching, and uh, he's done a lot of uh, uh, he's been angry at God for a few things. I think, um, and uh, in the midst of all of this. He's still praying, he's still going to church, he's, he's, he's still seeking the Lord, and, 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 uh, and you know, I've been helping him through some of this stuff as much as I can online. Uh, and uh, just this past week he said, you know, uh, through all of this, this junk that's gone on, uh, my faith has grown stronger. I made some decisions that that, that, that that weren't good, but my faith my faith has grown stronger. And I go, okay, that's that's good. What, what's going on? And and you know, I didn't sleep last night, so I prayed through the whole night. Okay. And this this guy is one of these people that when they say God speaks to them, uh, you can. I am 99% sure uh, that it is God that's actually speaking to him when he, when he says the things that he says. This is what God has said. Hmm. Okay. So God is speaking to you. This is cool. He's a really cool kid. Uh, uh, and he's an example of a disciple. He's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But his faith is strong even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of all the junk that life is throwing at him at the moment. Uh, really cool to see. Really cool to see here. I'm not actually in D.C. witnessing all of this. But stumbling and falling is an unfortunate natural part of growth. How we respond to our own failure when we fall. Number three, life's complications present us with moments where we must make faith decisions. Life's complications present us with moments where we must make faith decisions. Jesus pursues Peter. And when the disciples say, it's the Lord, he jumps out of the boat to go see him. That's a faith decision. It's Jesus. I must go see him. After they eat, Jesus takes them aside and walks with them. And again, he's confronted with faith, faith decisions. It's like my friend in BC. Life, uh, life kicked him hard in the gut. And he was forced to make a faith decision. Unfortunately, he's making the right ones. Life's complications present us with moments where we must make faith decisions. Hopefully you make the right ones. Number four. Jesus' pursuit of us is relentless. Jesus' pursuit of us is relentless. As we are trying to be disciples of Him, He is actually pursuing us. Peter screwed up, and he screwed up big. And there's one, one of the gospel stories, uh, in, the, in the moment he makes that third denial, Jesus turns and looks right at him. His pursuit of us is relentless. He's right there. He knows when we he knows when we stumble, and he's right there. But he makes it a point not to leave Peter in that in, in that state of failure. He comes after him. Tell Peter I've risen. I've risen. Peter, do you love me? Be my sheep. Peter, do you love me? At the end of the day, that's what matters. Jesus is asking us, 
you love me. Sometimes I wonder if we can even claim that we like him. His pursuit of us is relentless. Number five. Measuring our faith with that of others may be a good way of encouraging us to go deeper. But ultimately, we don't know the whole story. Measuring our faith with that of others may be a good way of encouraging us to go deeper. But ultimately, we don't know the whole story. After Jesus asks the third time, do you love me? Peter turns and he sees John, the disciple that Jesus loved. And he says, well, what about him? It's nice that you're asking me all these questions, but what about this guy? And Jesus basically says, don't worry about him. He's not, his journey is none of your concern. You follow me. Just before Bible college, when I was in this youth group, we had another, we had another guy who was heading up to Bible college, a different one than I went to. And uh, he would often sit, sit down and, and, and compare notes. You know, how many chapters of the Bible did you read this week? How many minutes are you spending in prayer? All that good stuff. And, you know, we'd be comparing this. You know, you know, and he'd be like, yeah, I read six chapters. I read, I read ten chapters this week. That's good. Reading is good. Um, for me, it's never been about quantity. You can read 50 chapters in a week. None of it gets in. I haven't done you a whole lot of good. I'm more about quality reading. If you, want to, if you want to read the scriptures, and I encourage you to do so, read until it starts speaking to you. And then it's like, okay. Thank you, Lord, for that. Pray. Internalize that stuff that you read. Grow. Might only be a few verses. Somebody else might read a whole chapter again. And then I get nothing. But they read a chapter so they can take it off on their devotional log if they make it, if they do them right in their little I got one I got my chapter in today. Quality reading is so much more important. So measuring what you're doing with, with, with what others are doing can be good, um, but ultimately we don't know everything that's going on in this person's life. So they could be reading nine chapters and, and, and living like the devil. Well, that, was a, that was a great verse. Now, now, let's, now let's watch a movie I should watch. Let's go download some stuff off the site that I need a credit card for. No more. We don't know the whole story. So, so, understand when Peter, when Jesus says to Peter, don't worry about that guy. Let me worry about him. You follow me. Your job is to not measure yourself against that of others. Your job is to follow Jesus. Lastly tonight, when you fail, don't give up. When you fail, don't give up. I know far too many students who have made tragic choices and I walked away from the day. It's very painful to watch them destroy their lives. Don't 
give up. Get up, start walking in. A friend of mine online said this, it's from another country. We have to learn how to crawl before we walk, and we have to learn how to walk before we run. If you're still crawling, that's good. If you're walking and you stumble, get back up and walk. If you're running and you stumble, get back up and run. Don't stay in that fallen state. Get up. Get on with it. Questions, comments, reading your windows.